All right. Then what we're doing for the rest of the day is we're wrapping up biocontrol. At the end of the last lesson, we touched on classical biocontrol, which is sort of the, uh, the way that we usually think of biocontrol. You have some sort of invasive species. People go to that, uh, state, that species' native habitat. They search for biocontrol agents, and then they uh, release them in the new area in order to provide control. Uh, however, there are lots of pests that require biological control or have biocontrol agents uh, that are native to the region. And so you can't just go out there and find new biocontrol agents for them. Uh, what we should try to do instead, maybe, is to enhance the biocontrol we have so that we are providing uh, generally just more control overall than we had before. And so this generally falls under two major categories. We've got conservation and augmentation, two different sort of uh, philosophies on how to do biocontrol. So we're going to cover those today. We're focusing in at first on conservation. So conservation is... Well, we spend a lot of time in IPM talking about manipulating the habitat so that it is less beneficial to the pests. This is kind of the opposite idea. We're trying to take a habitat and manipulate it so that it is very favorable to the biocontrol bio agents. So how can we enhance the environment to improve the survival, dispersal, and reproduction of the natural enemies that we already have in the system? And so, again, the basic idea is that we already have natural enemies, so let's get them up and running. And primarily, this helps us to control pests that are already established in the system and already have natural enemies that work against them. And so, pretty much the clearest way to get at this, uh, sort of the most obvious, is to avoid, reduce, or eliminate as many broad-spectrum pesticides as we can. Or in other words, pesticides that target those natural enemies. So if every time you're spraying an insecticide, you're not just killing the pest, but you're also killing all of the beneficial organisms that feed on it, parasitize it, uh, etc., you're basically working against yourself. You're getting that nice short-term control, but you're letting your long-term control uh, get a little bit out of hand. So selective pesticides are considered generally the best way to get at this immediately. So when I talk about Selective insecticides, there are two major ways in insecticides. This is selective chemistries in general. So when we talk about selective pesticides, there are two major ways we can get at this. The first of which is through the use of uh, the chemistry spectrum. The idea that not all chemistries are going to be broad spectrum and harm everything, but that we have a whole range. We have some chemistries that are going to be more targeted towards the pest, and we're going to have some chemistries that are more broad. And we just call these narrow spectrum versus broad spectrum and pesticides. With the narrow spectrum, also known as selective pesticides, being those that are toxic to a specific target species or maybe to a specific family of pests. And since, at least in the case of insects, uh, you tend, and as well as in a lot of fungi, you tend to have distinct families that tend to have lots of pests, uh, whereas beneficials tend to fall under other families. Oftentimes, just having a pesticide narrowed down to a family is enough, enough selectivity that you'll kill the pests. Maybe you'll kill some related non-pests, but you're not going to kill a whole lot of your beneficials. Then on the flip side, we've got, a, the, obviously, the broad-spectrum pesticides, those where the chemistry is designed to be toxic to a broad range of organisms. So you're not just killing your target pests, but you're also killing the beneficials. It's sort of an indiscriminate spray. And so a big movement in pesticides generally has been this movement away from broad spectrum uh, technologies and moving towards these more selective ones. That's been pretty common. Now in some cases you can actually get selective activity while still using a broad spectrum pesticide. And we can do this through what we would call selective application. Or in other words just applying the broad spectrum pesticide in such a way that the non, uh, I'm sorry, the nat natural enemies won't be exposed to it, right? So there's a couple ways you can do this. Uh, for example, bait stations. If you've got a pest that likes to uh, feed on a specific plant, a specific uh, type of fruit, you could always lay out some of that fruit laced with a broad spectrum pesticide. 
and kill it when it goes to feed on that, because the natural enemies aren't going to go and feed on the bait. They'll only feed on the natural enemy. So these spot treatments. So if you have, say, a hot spot in the field that's covered in aphids, you can just spray that hot spot and you'll protect all of the natural enemies in the surrounding area. And then clearly the most uh, obvious one, the one we talk about a lot, is the use of systemic pesticides. Those that go into the plant are taken up by the roots or absorbed through the leaves and are carried around within the tissues so that you only get a lethal dose if you actually consume plant tissue. So a good example of this would be something like carbaryl, which is a broad-spectrum carbamate used to treat uh, basically any number of insect pests. It's an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, so it kills all insects. All insects have acetylcholinesterase. Uh, and it's, you know, kind of frowned upon from an IPM perspective because it does kill everything. And it's uh, not very friendly to natural enemies, uh, especially if you apply it as a foliar spray in which not only are you killing those natural enemies, but you're also killing honeybees in a lot of cases if you're spraying on, um, uh, during bloom periods. Uh, however, there has been a lot of success in repurposing this in a narrow spectrum application where they apply it as a bait, uh, basically mixing it with some uh, meals as well as some basic sugar components to bind it all together. And it's really appealing to sort of broad generalist pests, such as caterpillars, um, cutworm, cutworm caterpillars, earwigs, grasshoppers, and the like. They really like that. All right, so that's just basically eliminating pesticides. On the flip side, we can also make the habitat better just by trying to increase the things within that area, within that ecosystem, that the natural enemies like. So, as I mentioned before, conservation is all about boosting the natural enemies you already have. So they exist in these agroecosystems, but oftentimes they're kept at pretty low levels because they're not super well adapted to the conditions we have there. And a big part of that is just that we have these agroecosystems where we have a ton of disturbance all the time. We've got tillage, we've got harvests, we've got different crops coming in and out, uh, we've got irrigation regimes, pesticides going in, and these are all things that are really great for our lovely R-adapted pests. Remember the R-type, they move into disturbed habitats, they reproduce quickly. But a lot of natural enemies are more K-adapted. They need nice stable habitats in order to survive in. And so they don't do super great in this sort of scenario. So one of the ways we can get at this uh, is to basically, instead of having the whole habitat being highly disturbed all the time, we can create little havens for natural enemies to survive in, areas that are uh, alternative habitats that are going to be very stable and allow the natural enemy to build up to larger populations, which can then move into the surrounding fields. So these may be things like providing a sheltered space that doesn't say get tilled or harvested, perhaps providing alternative food sources, or maybe even just leaving an overwintering site so that you're not starting from ground zero every single season. <clears throat> so as far as alternative food sources are concerned, for a lot of these organisms, we're interested in them because their food source is the pest. So naturally, when we don't have the crop, we don't have the pest around, we don't have something for them to eat. But many of these natural enemies actually don't just rely entirely on the pest, they have multiple food sources that they consume. In the case of parasitic wasps, uh, the larvae develop inside the pest, but once they have emerged as adults, those adults are nectivorous, right? They like to feed on nectar from plants around the field. And so uh, you can have a problem where if you have a whole bunch of wasps out and they're hatching and emerging as adults, they may need to actually leave the field in order to feed. And if there are not readily available weeds, you may be actually losing a lot of them before they can come back and infect new hosts. So one way to get around this that's been receiving some attention recently is basically planting around the outside of the field uh, some sort of nectar-rich crop uh, or a nectar-rich weed that's not going to get into the, uh, I use weed, I shouldn't have, some nectar-rich plant. Obviously you want to target some sort of plant that's not going to invade your field readily. But so uh, here was an experiment someone ran 
where what they did was they planted sesame around the outside of rice fields uh, because sesame is known to produce a fair amount of nectar that parasitic wasps like to use. And then they just measured uh, sort of the amount of control they got from parasitoids, the amount of, um, and how this translated into costs of production. And ultimately what they found was that the total pest density was reduced by several orders of magnitude from 10 to 100 times uh, in the fields that had the nectar source for the parasitoids, uh, that they saw a pretty substantial boost in parasitism, and ultimately this translated into about a 70% reduction in insecticide sprays and a 5% bump in yield for their rice. So just providing this little bit of uh, nectar translated into a huge increase in the amount of biocontrol action that they were getting. And that's a relatively small investment if you're cutting out, in this case, here we have the number of sprays in the crop. They went from three sprays down to one. So cutting out two sprays uh, more than pays for a little bit of sesame irrigation. Ah. Alternatively, a lot of these parasitoids do need something to reproduce it, even if the crop is gone. So if you have a crop out there, you've got lots of aphids, and you've got, say, parasitic wasps laying their eggs in them, as soon as you harvest that crop and remove the aphids, the parasitic wasp can no longer complete its life cycle. It needs to leave the area to find uh, somewhere to survive. And so one thing that's been suggested is planting alternative hosts adjacent to the field, something that will maintain aphid species uh, over the off-season. And this will be just sort of a reserve for these wasps to move into and in, uh, basically to basically maintain their life cycle over the winter so that in the spring when you replant, they can just move right back in and start providing control immediately. Does that increase the likelihood of outbreaks by having a stable population? That's a good question. Um, ideally, what you would do is you would try to match it up so that the pests, the aphids that are being maintained on those weedy banks aren't going to be the aphids that are in your crop. So ideally, uh, trying to target a different species, but something that can support the wasps. However, it is not unheard of <laughs> for these sort of reserves to be a source of inoculation. And so uh, that's something we'll touch on a little bit later, but that's a really good question. But so this is being done in some areas. Uh, in Salinas, they use these weeds in between sort of lettuce plantings to support aphids and uh, keep the parasitoids around. Uh, I, said, I said lettuce, I meant broccoli. Excuse me. Well, would they work for lettuce too? Yeah, in theory. I know that this has been actively cultivated in terms of, in relation to broccoli. But I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be used for lettuce as well. Uh, thinking outside of the parasitoids, because that's kind of what we've been talking about here for a bit. Uh, alternatively, you can maintain predators, such as beetles, through the same idea. You would provide them with something called a beetle bank. Uh, this is a strip of grass or any number of perennial uh, plants that are from the region. Uh, basically, you just sort of strip it out so that it is within the field that you are growing. Sort of these nice lines of a little hump about one to two feet wide, stretching the length of the field. And this is just a reserve that when you harvest, the beetles can move from the area, from the crop, into this reserve area, this beetle bank. And then when you replant, they could feasibly move out and start providing biocontrol once again. And what's nice about these is that they are sufficiently diverse that you won't necessarily just be preserving a single species but ideally you'd be preserving an entire cohort of biocontrol. Uh, not just uh, insects, but arguably also some vertebrates, such as birds and the like. And it's really handy for uh, beetles in particular because you have uh, little carabid beetles. Uh, anyone remember the carabidae? Medconomic entomology, seeing some heads, yeah. Little flightless beetles for the most part. Uh, their elytra are oftentimes fused shut, so they can't fly at all. Uh, they can't fly, so they can't get real far out of the field. So having these things within three to 600 feet uh, 
is uh, just a nice place for them to crawl to, to hang out, and so they can crawl back out whenever the season starts. And similar idea with spiders. Since they can't fly, having these beetle banks close provides a really easy place for them to head to. Uh, there have been some experiments. Beetle banks have really been pushed in England. There have been some preliminary studies that suggest that you can get a fair amount of control, up to 34% uh, control in cereals uh, against aphids just from providing beetle banks. So before you go on, 34% control, I don't understand what that means. So 34% control... <laughs> That would be my, my assumption, is that it's 34% reduced compared to the control treatment. And then on the flip side, as far as maintaining these habitats and making the habitat more helpful, you can also uh, reduce the amount of uh, crop residue removement. <laughs> so. People may see a conflict with this as well in the uh, sanitation we talked about earlier. But uh, oftentimes, in the interest of sanitation, right, we will harvest our crops and then we will take whatever is left over in the field and it will be tilled under, it'll be burned, maybe it'll be completely removed from the setting. And this is ideally going to reduce the amount of pathogens and pests that are maintained in the field for the next season. On the flip side, in some cases, you may have biocontrol agents uh, within that trimming. You may have things like parasitic wasps hanging out inside of we, um, pests that are left in there. And so by harvesting them or burning them, we may be reducing our reserves of biocontrol moving into the next season. So kind of a double-edged sword. Hmm. And so um, what they found is that in some cases, you actually end up ahead of the game if you leave it behind if you leave all of your trimmings in the field, uh, just because you will retain those biocontrols and the biological control you get is better than the benefit you get from removing the pests in the first place. Uh, this is recommended in some uh, things like Eugenia, which is a ornamental plant, but they found that leaving the trimmings for one to two weeks provides enough time for the parasitoids to emerge and so that you basically don't have to leave them all season, but you can trim them, leave them for one to two weeks, and then clean them out, and you'll still maintain your biocontrol while removing all of that extra sanitation material. Uh, in India, they actually ran an experiment looking at this. So traditionally, when growing sugarcane, uh, the policy is that you would harvest, remove all of the uh, extra material from the field, and then burn it somewhere off-site. And ideally, the uh, idea here is that you are removing the overwintering host for these guys, the uh, sugar cane leaf hoppers, and you're just reducing that initial pest inoculum. However, uh, in some fields, these sugar cane pests aren't a huge problem because you have a lot of parasitic wasps that are feeding on them and are keeping those populations low. And so when people would remove the sugar cane, what they found was that a pest such as the leafhopper that wasn't a problem the year before may be a problem the next year because they lost all of their biocontrol. So they ran this experiment where essentially they harvested sugarcane at a number of sites. At some of them, they left the sugarcane there over the off-season, just hanging out. And some of them, they did the traditional cleaning. And so these are the results they got. Uh, here we have the density of the pest as this black line. And then we have the rate of parasitism in the gray bars. And so on this site, we have one of the sanitized sites, right? So essentially, they removed all the sugar cane. And what you can see is that as the season progresses, the pest density grows. And it takes a while for the biocontrol to establish itself and to increase the parasitism rate. Whereas in a site where the trash was kept, because you had that initial inoculum of the biocontrol right off the bat, when the pest population grows, the biocontrol can answer very quickly. It's already there. Biocontrol populations can uh, react and knock the pest population down very efficiently. So essentially, it's just a case where sanitation 
may actually cause more problems just because you are removing that initial biocontrol inoculum. And then alternatively, in some cases, and this is uh, relatively uncommon, but in some cases we can actually harvest in such a way that we maintain habitat within the field. Uh, basically harvest in such a way that we uh, remove the habitat for the pest, but save some for the natural enemies, at least enough that they can recolonize quickly. Right, and exactly what I said. Alternative harvest techniques to keep the natural enemies in the field so they will recolonize quickly. Uh, we've talked a couple times about this alfalfa system, right? If you have alfalfa and you have a whole lot of lingus bugs, you can harvest it in strips, leaving some tall alfalfa in nice strips throughout the field. The lygus bug will move there, stay in the alfalfa, and they won't just all fly out and move to a crop such as cotton, where they cause a whole lot more damage. Well, someone took a look at this situation and realized also that by leaving those strips, you were essentially creating sort of artificial beetle banks, a artificial area where lots of biocontrol agents can hang out over the long term. And so essentially what they did was they went into those fields that were using strip harvest as compared to fields where they harvested everything at once. And they just counted how many different biocontrol agents are being maintained in those fields. They looked at spiders, predatory bugs, wasps, lady beetles, and lacewings. And what they found was that with the gray bar being conventional, so harvesting everything all at once, whereas dark being a border treatment, which would be a strip or leaving a narrow border around the field of alfalfa that's untreated, we can see that there are substantially more spiders, bugs, and wasps being maintained in these um, strip or border harvested fields. Very little impact on the ladybugs and the lacewings. My guess would be that this is because ladybugs and lacewings are relatively strong flyers in comparison to things like... Uh, wasps and bugs, which are uh, either very small or just aren't generally good flyers, or things like spiders that don't fly at all. So they need some way to walk into a habitat that's protective. And then finally, in terms of making the habitat better, there are certain uh, natural enemies that are going to be interfered with by other organisms in the habitat. So Probably the most obvious example of this would be something like ants and honeydew-producing pests. So when you have something like scales or aphids, right, they're feeding on sap, they're producing a whole bunch of sugary honeydew excrement. And oftentimes ants will like to crawl up the trees and feed on this honeydew. And because the honeydew is a lovely free sugar source, they like to invest in protecting those pests. And so you'll get sort of this interesting ant aphid or ant scale uh, herding behavior. And uh, there are some cases where when the aphids become agitated, say a lady beetle shows up and tries to feed on the aphids, they'll release pheromones which tell the ants to come over and they'll actually start attacking the ladybugs and start removing all that biocontrol that we're getting from that species. So one way that you can sort of uh, protect your biocontrol agents and increase their efficiency is you can try and come up with ways to uh, keep these sort of pest alternative pest species, these ants, out of the system. Easy way to do this is just to use some sort of sticky material, like a, um, this is tanglefoot. You can put tanglefoot near the base of the plant, because ants can't fly, they crawl up the plant, they get stuck in the tanglefoot, they can't go up and protect the scales, the mealybugs, the aphids, from your natural enemies that you've got in the system. Uh, clearly, this is a little bit more of an IPM on a small scale. It's easy to go out into your yard and apply tanglefoot to your rose bushes. It's a little challenging to go out and apply tanglefoot to a whole grove of trees. So that being said, we had some good questions uh, that pointed out some of the issues around conservation biocontrol. Um, one of which being the idea that while it's all well and good to want to have flowery borders that provide nectar and overwintering spaces for biocontrol agents, these things can be difficult to utilize in really large-scale operations. 
especially somewhere here like the Central Valley where anything that you choose to grow is going to require irrigation, right? So anything you choose to grow, uh, you have to count that against any potential cost in water. Alternatively, sometimes these borders provide habitat not just for natural enemies, but also for pest species potentially. So while you may be saving your natural enemies, you may also be inoculating your field with some sort of aphid or a beetle or any number of pests that like to overwinter in weeds. Or you may just have a whole bunch of weeds hanging out on your border that are going to dump seeds into your field all the time. Uh, also, <laughs> these plants may be a uh, good harbor for various plant diseases. And so you maybe have a nice little uh, plant virus harbor so that when aphids move in, they can just sort of transmit diseases into your field directly. And then finally, it is an investment of time and money. So you have to pay for the water, you have to pay for the planting, you have to pay for the seeds. It's all stuff that you have to do. And so it all just needs to be balanced against the potential benefits. So if you're an organic grower and you're trying to avoid applying chemicals as much as humanly possible, then maybe these are a really good investment. If you're maybe a little more conventional and you think that uh, you know the relative benefit you're going to get from having some beetles in your beetle bank is not enough to justify all the work, conservation biocontrol may not be for you. Or alternatively, maybe you don't want to do a beetle bank, maybe you don't want to manipulate the habitat, but you can always use narrow spectrum pesticides. That's a really good way and a really easy thing to do that's going to benefit the system and keep a lot of biocontrol around that you may otherwise lose. All right. The other major type of natural control that we have is augmentation. And augmentation is what we're going to be looking at today when we go to lab. Uh, it's the process of basically releasing reared natural enemies into a system where natural enemies are either absent, occur too late, or occur in numbers so small that they don't provide any real control. This is typically used when establishing natural enemies permanently is not possible, or if they do establish, they're in such small numbers that they don't provide economic control. So... Again, this would be a case where we're looking at, say, a native pest as opposed to an um, invasive one, where we're trying to establish something through classical control. Uh, and because we are consistently releasing pests, because it's not just good enough to uh, basically establish a natural enemy once and have it take care of the problem long term, you have to keep releasing natural enemies over and over and over again, this is relatively expensive. And then finally, when we're doing this, we're talking about releasing natural enemies that are native to the region. So we're not doing something like classical, where we're going around and exploring new habitats and uh, releasing non-native species. We're really talking about, say, releasing more lady beetles, releasing more parasitic wasps, et cetera, et cetera. So two major types of augmentation. We've got inundative augmentation. Uh, this is basically augmentate, this is augmentation where we release a whole bunch of pests of uh, natural enemies. Jesus, keep saying pests. We release a whole bunch of natural enemies, and we basically assume that that initial release is going to provide the control. So if we release a whole bunch of wasps, such as this trichogramma. Uh, which is going to go out and parasitize Lepidopteran eggs. We release a large number of them. They go out and parasitize the eggs. The eggs die. Uh, but generally, the amount of parasitic wasps that we have hatching is not enough to really establish in the field and provide control for the rest of the season. So we'll get an initial amount of control, and then after that, not very much at all. So large numbers released at one time. Immediate use. So this is almost like a pesticide application, right? It provides immediate control. And it's primarily the way that we use things like nematodes and microorganisms. 
So uh, it's like I was talking about those microbial or uh, bioactive pesticides. Those ones where you basically have a slurry of bacteria or fungi that you spray directly on the field. That would be a good example of inundative augmentation. On the flip side, we have inoculative augmentation. This is one where you release the natural enemies, but these natural enemies are very good at reproducing in the field. So they produce lots of progeny, and those progeny move out and actually provide control later on in the season. And so typically the way we would do this is you would have some sort of small initial release at the beginning of the season, maybe a couple other small releases as the season progresses. And just as we move through the season, these natural enemy populations will build up. And so ideally, uh, they'll keep up with the, with the pests and stop you from ever hitting that sort of uh, treatment threshold throughout the season. This is a common way to treat mites. So predatory mites uh, typically do really well through small initial releases that can ramp up over time, especially in greenhouses. So you don't have to go out and dump a whole bunch of mites over and over and over again. And typically this would be something that the natural enemy does really well during the summer growing season, but as soon as you hit the uh, winter time, they don't overwinter real well. So you'll need to necessitate uh, further releases. All right. So uh, as far as biocontrol is concerned, we've spent a lot of time talking about insects, uh, a little bit of time talking about pathogens. There is another type of biocontrol that's gaining a little bit of interest but hasn't taken off hugely yet, and that's the use of nematodes. So there are these entomophagous nematodes, or basically nematodes that like to feed on insects, especially insects that have a stage in the soil. And so what's kind of nice about these is that essentially, because they're nematodes, they're very small, you can rear them in sort of a nutrient broth, and then you can just apply that broth to your field using a sprayer. And typically this would be done so in sort of an augmentative fashion. You know you have insects in the field, you apply the nematodes, they provide some sort of short-term control. <laughs> typically the way these guys work is that it's not the actual nematode that kills the pest, but rather that the nematode is a sort of vector for pathogenic bacteria that will kill the insect. So you basically would, say, uh, apply some sort of gel, a clay matrix, or a spray to the soil that contains the nematodes or nematode eggs. Uh, these nematodes would then hatch, move through the soil, and whenever they find an insect, they would burrow into it, uh, inoculate it with the bacteria that they carry, and basically just feed on the insect until it dies, and then crawl out. So what we have here is a um, what appears to be some sort of coleopteran larva, so a little grub that was living in the soil. It's been infected by nematodes, and it has died, and uh, someone broke it open just to show how many nematodes were inside of it. And that's what we've got scattered all around it. Or just so those nematodes didn't kill that. Typically. Typically the bacteria will kill the nematode and then I just kill the insect and then the nematodes will just sort of feed off the dead insect wow. until they're ready to emerge from the system. I was going to say that's a lot of nematodes. Are you sure that didn't kill the insect? Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, alternatively, people are trying to find lots of ways to apply biocontrol agents in a way that is easy for growers. So we've got sort of rigs like this where people can mount um, containers of predatory mites onto the back of their tractor and this guy's just driving through a strawberry field and sort of shaking the mites down onto the plants as he moves along. Um, whenever we go to Mulholland Farms what they do is they have the uh, parasitic wasps, uh, these guys, Pytus malinus, inside little uh, cardboard containers just sort of uh, almost like little, I guess it's like a soup bowl, essentially. Those soup bowls you can get at the supermarket where you have a plastic lid. You just go out into your citrus and you pop the lid off and all the little wasps fly out. And so what people often do is just ride around on the back of an ATV, you know, and pop one open, you know, every time they enter a new acre and release them that way. So as far as natural enemies are concerned, when you're doing augmentation, 
Uh, typically, you have to purchase your natural enemies, uh, or you have to rear them yourself in large enough numbers to provide control. So oftentimes, you will have to purchase these from some sort of commercial biocontrol company. Um, something to keep in mind is that oftentimes these can vary in quality. Some people do really good work, uh, but my experience has been that biocontrol companies tend to pop up and disappear with some regularity. And so uh, some of those companies are not doing as good of a job as they could be, or they're new and they don't have their techniques worked out yet. So you might take a while to find a company that you like working with. And some growers basically have just thrown that all out the window and said, you know what, we can raise our own insects easily enough. So they just have their own biocontrol rearing facilities, uh, which is what we'll be seeing today in terms of Mulholland Farm. So challenges. There are challenges to all sorts of control, and augmentation is no exception. The biggest challenge with augmentation is that it is prone to failure. And the major reason that it's prone to failure is that when you're releasing a natural enemy, it is basically primed to come out of whatever container you have it in and immediately start attacking the pest. So if for whatever reason the predator and the pest are out of sync, then you're not going to get very good control. So say you release it when the pest is not in the right life stage to be attacked. Uh, maybe you bought a poor quality natural enemy, so the company you bought it from is producing a pretty weak lady beetle so that they aren't very good at hunting. Uh, alternatively, like we talked about last week, there's always the possibility that uh, when you release the natural enemy, they aren't going to be very well suited to controlling pests in a very small field. Uh, things like lady beetles, they tend to migrate from the field as soon as you release them, if they are in large enough numbers. They don't like to congregate in large groups. And so, you know, you may ultimately get very little control with releasing them in big numbers. No, I see ladybugs congregate in large groups. Oh, yeah? yeah hundreds of them. Oh, like on the sides of houses? Yeah, and the, it's cold. Yeah, the uh, Harmonia axiritis. They like to do that for uh, overwintering. Yeah, but they don't tend to hunt in large groups. We should go to the Ladybug Trail at the South Fork. Oh, you do get a fair number up there, oh, too? Yeah, they just start breeding in the snow. Well, just millions of them. So I guess I'll put a caveat on that. Most insects do like to get together in big groups when they're doing it. But, um, That's why it's called the ladybug trap. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That makes sense. Yeah, and with the, uh, so the lady beetles you get in the house, they're a specific species, um, the Asian multicolored lady beetle. In their native habitat, they like to mate on the sides of uh, cliffs. So they like nice vertical surfaces that have earth tones. So they found in the United States, especially in regions like this where we don't have a lot of cliff sides, uh, they like to mate on the sides of houses especially if the houses have kind of a, a nice earth tony <coughs> sort of a beige color to it. They find that really attractive. So they can uh, get in there. I have thousands of them inside my doghouse. Oh, really? Inside your doghouse? Inside the doghouse. <laughs> How'd the dog handle it? <laughs> they didn't care. They were fine. Oh, all right. They come out like 20 or 30 of them. As long as the dog doesn't mind, I guess that's not a big problem. I think, I think the Asian multicolored beetles are kind of stinky. Like they smell, uh, I think they smell kind of like rotten cabbage. So I don't like having them around. But that's really my only complaint. Ah, and then finally, before we go, just wanted to touch on biocontrol of weeds. So we spent a lot of time talking about insects, and that's because in agricultural systems, insects are really the best studied in terms of biocontrol. Uh, there is some biocontrol of weeds, but we find that it's relatively uncommon in crop systems. Typically, most biocontrol of weeds is done um, out in large sort of rangeland areas. And there's a lot of reasons why uh, we don't do real well controlling weeds with biocontrol in agricultural settings. Uh, most of which is that overall there's just too much disturbance for natural enemies to really establish nice stable populations. And also because, in general, biocontrol requires that the pest stays available at low concentrations to maintain a biocontrol population. 
So if you introduce some sort of, say, weevil to control weed in your field, if the weevil goes through and kills all the weeds and then has to wait a whole next season for the weed to show up to feed on again, that weevil's not going to be around. It's going to be missing its food source. It's going to die out. Or it's going to leave that field and search for some weeds somewhere else to feed. So it's hard for them to establish. Uh, this actually happened in California with the puncture vine. People familiar with puncture vine? Goat yeah, goat heads. Um, so they introduced a couple of weevils to control goat heads, and they were super effective. They like more or less wiped out goat heads. Uh, the problem was they were so effective that um, the goat head population was reduced so low that the weevils didn't have enough food sources to maintain a population, and they died out, and goat heads came back. Hence, the fact that I have to change my tires about every two days <laughs> at the beginning of the fall semester on my bike. <laughs> so, exactly. So weeds can be problematic because they've got this nice seed bank. They've got a long-term plan. It's a little bit hard for biocontrol to keep them under control. And then also, the fact is that agricultural weeds oftentimes occur in complexes of similar species. So uh, if you eliminate one species with biocontrol, typically another one will just come up in its place and fill that exact same niche. And so even if you can provide control, you might not actually be eliminating the problem, you just might be eliminating a single species. So typically, where we see most biocontrol weeds is in pastures and forests. Uh, rangelands, more wild habitats or semi-wild habitats. And um, typically areas where the weed is causing some sort of damage to livestock. And, so to, and then the ultimate strategy being not necessarily to kill the weed, but to provide enough control that you knock it down, and then the natives can repopulate the area and outcompete the weed in the long term. So I had an example. I'm not going to go over it because we're running out of time, and this is the last slide anyway. I already talked about the weevils and the uh, goat heads. So basically the same idea, though, that uh, they had some extreme success in controlling climate weed with the, uh, not climate weed, yeah, climate weed with the climate weed beetle in California. So with that, again, if you're planning on riding in the van and haven't told me, please let me know. I think right now I've only got maybe four or five people planning on riding in the van today. So there's still some room if you want to come along. We'll be leaving at 2 o'clock from Ag 119.